Hi, my name is Annalise Mortier. I'm a Kavli Fellow at the University of Cambridge, um, working on exoplanet detection and stellar characterization. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about lessons we can learn from Sun as a star observations uh, in the context of extremely precise radio velocities. So over the years, uh, we have discovered ex exoplanets at an exponential rate. Uh, what you can see here is the total number of planets detected um, in logarithmic scale uh, versus the year of discovery. So this linear trend you see actually means an exponential rise uh, where the doubling time is about 29 months after we double the amount of exoplanets we discover. Now, um, as you can see, and it's not that surprising, uh, we're actually slowing down a little in the last couple of years. And one of the reasons for that is because it's becoming uh, harder and harder to actually detect um, exoplanets, especially the smaller exoplanets are not straightforward um, to discover. If you plot all the exoplanet discoveries on another graph uh, here, you have the semi-amplitude of the radial velocity signal, again, logarithmic scale, meters per second versus the year of discovery. Um, the color represents the statistical significance of the semi-amplitude, uh, where it's simply defined as how many sigmas is it away from zero. Um, so there's a couple things you can see here. Uh, first of all, that in the beginning, we started pushing downwards towards smaller and smaller signals. Uh, better instruments uh, were developed, such as HARPS and HIRAS, uh, Optional Espresso Express, the, um, that allow us to actually detect the smaller semi amplitudes. And, um, the other thing that you can see is that in the last decade or something, uh, we very rarely actually cross the one meter per second barrier. Um, now, one reason for that would be instruments. Um, some instruments are simply not as stable and precise on the one meter per second level, but others are. The Harps Nerd stability is about 80 centimeters per second. Uh, Express and Espresso are, are far better, with Espresso uh, having the 10 centimeter per second um, stability. Now, uh, only in a few times have we actually crossed the one meter per second barrier um, in both cases, both this one and this one here, um, they're a radial velocity detected system where there are respectively 5,000 and 8,000 data points um, signaling the extraordinary effort it takes to actually cross that barrier. Uh, having good instruments is crucial. Having good modeling techniques is um, equally as crucial. Um, and one of the reasons we can't cross this barrier is because the modeling of the stellar signal in the data um, is just not straightforward, whilst the planetary signal is a nice, clean, stable sinusoid over time. The stellar signal can go all over the place and sometimes has, well, often has amplitudes far greater than one meter per second. And it's really hindering us in um, characterizing the very smallest planets and uh, detecting the mass of the very smallest um, planets. So uh, one thing I almost always say is know the star to know the planet. Yeah, you really only can know an exoplanet if you know its host star. The one very obvious reason for that is the fact that we do uh, indirect measurements. It's not the planet that we observe with the transit technique nor the radio velocity technique, it's the star that, and we infer the planetary characteristics based on the stellar ones. So uh, you really do have to know your host star as in what's its mass, what's its radius, um, in order to also know the mass and the radius of the planet. But it goes so much further than that uh, when you cross, the, um, when you enter the stellar activity issue. Uh, and I slightly adapted my quote to, you can really only find your exoplanet if you know its host star. Um, because we're looking for such small signals in the data, uh, and because the star uh, has signals of their own, uh, it's sometimes plain impossible or very, very hard and very tricky um, to find 
the signal from the exoplanet amongst all the signals from the star itself. So the most problematic noise, between quotes, because let's not call it noise, uh, is the star itself. Uh, stars are not static. This is a beautiful picture uh, of a magnetic cycle uh, of our own sun uh, from 1996 to 2006, where 1996 and 2006 were solar minimum and 2001 was clearly solar maximum. And, um, so our sun is clearly not static. It's active, it has spots, it has flashes, it has flares, uh, it goes, it has a magnetic cycle, it goes through this magnetic cycle. Um, as you can see nice here, the, now if the sun is doing that, then obviously all the stars are doing this as well. The, um, so in order to actually find an Earth twin or in order to characterize the very smallest planets and get these very small semi-amplitudes in the radial velocity, um, it's crucial that we understand stellar variability. It's crucial that we understand what processes like we see here, the, um, how they affect our data and how we can actually take them into account to then extract the smallest signals um, from the um, planets. Now, there's a lot of benefits in observing the sun as it would be a star. Uh, and as we like to say, is uh, what the, the, by far the greatest benefit is that the sun is the only star we know that has no orbiting planets. Now, I know what you're thinking. Obviously, the sun has orbiting planets. We're currently standing on one. We see them right here in this picture. Um, but the good thing is, is that we actually know the solar system. We know it quite well. So that allows us to actually remove it from the data. The, um, this is the only star in the entire universe that we can be 100% sure has no planetary signals in the data because we can very confidently remove them. Any other star in the universe, we can right now not know whether it has additional planets that we simply can't see. Uh, we don't know what it looks like. So the sun really is the only one uh, where we are sure that the data set we're working with is either instrumental effects uh, or stellar effects. And, um, so the other thing that makes the sun such a good object is the fact that we can actually resolve the sun. It's uh, quite large in the sky. Uh, we can look at, as you see in this picture, where do the um, stellar activity regions, where are they, how many spots are we talking about, how strong are they, how many plages are there, what's the magnetic field like. So we have a quite detailed resolved picture of the sun that we can then compare with these sun as a star observations and see if we could relate one to another in order to then also be able to do that for uh, other stars where we can't resolve them and don't know what's going on on the surface. So cell activity, um, as you might know, happens on multiple timescales. Uh, most of this will be covered in the talk by Heather Segla, which I highly recommend you watch. The, um, so there's the solar magnetic cycle, which you've seen before. Um, for the sun, uh, it's roughly about 11 years. The length of this is not stable, the, um, nor is it the same for any other star. So what you see here on the right is the sunspot number versus time uh, starting from the 1900s. So uh, you see it clearly goes through this cycle um, where you go to a solar maximum and then a solar minimum, solar maximum, solar minimum. And you see it does that about every 11 years. Um, although, as you might see, the um, cycle here uh, had quite an extended uh, minimum, so it's not exactly 11 years. The, then within a cycle, as you can see as well, uh, sometimes solar maxima are higher than others. The, um, the one here in the middle was uh, the highest where you have some other cycles, such as our, the current cycle that we just came out of, uh, that are quite a bit lower than other cycles. So it's very variable and it's very unpredictable. The, um, Within the cycle, 
um, you have effects uh, mainly from stellar rotation, solar rotation, um, for the sun that happens on time scales of about 25 to 30 days. Uh, for a lot of solar like stars, it happens on time scales between 25 and 30 days. Um, and it's simply related to the rotation of your sun, of your star, uh, where magnetic regions come in and out of you. And, um, then there's other time scales related to granulation, oscillation, flows um, that can go from a couple minutes to several hours to several days um, and are currently very, very hard um, to control and to understand. So stellar activity is highly variable, happens on multiple time scales, and is uh, very present in our data. Now, Sun as a star observations for EPRV work. Uh, so obviously the Sun is being studied by way, way more uh, by, by way more teams and by way more telescopes than what I um, mentioned here. Uh, here I only try to list the ones that are important for the EPRV work in the context of exoplanet detection. Um, so first, you can just go with simulations. Those are not real observations. Um, so you can either use full simulated spectra, uh, as has been done by the Lagrange Mouillet des Arts group, um, and recently by a uh, very nice work came out from uh, Gilbertson et al. Um, that released uh, simulated solar spectra. Uh, you can also just simulate the cross correlation functions, uh, which is a quite standard technique um, to extract radial velocities, um, as you probably hear in other talks. The, there's a couple codes for that. SOAP and SOAP 2.0 um, are very known. There's probably others. The, um, then we can do indirect observations. The, um, we can observe the sun via the moon or via the asteroids and basically observe the reflected sunlight, uh, as has been done by Antonia Lanzara, Phil Hayward, uh, and others. The, or you can uh, indirectly do it by reconstructing um, radial velocity from resolved observations. So where you take resolved observations of the sun and then piece it all together uh, as if you have the one measurement of an unresolved sun, uh, which would be treating it as a star. And, uh, this has been done with MDI SOHO data, with SDO data, um, again by uh, the Meunier group, Rafi Haywood's group, um, Tim Milburn and others. Um, and then, lately, in the last couple of years, we're doing direct observations. Now, direct observations of the sun are not new. Um, what makes it new is that they're currently being done uh, with uh, solar telescopes being fed into high-resolution spectrographs that are being used for extremely precise radio velocities and are being used for exoplanet detection purposes. Um, so about five years ago, um, the Harps North Solar Telescope was installed. And, um, the first three years of spectra will be released uh, soon, 1st of September 2020. The first three and a half years of rate of velocities have already been released um, and uh, you can just play with. The, um, then two years ago, uh, a similar solar telescope was installed um, to be fed into HARPS uh, in Chile, in the Southern uh, Hemisphere. Um, there will be a two-year rolling proprietary period for those. Uh, first data will be public uh, from October this year, 2020, um, and then just on a rolling way, uh, the same manner that ESO makes all its data public. Um, there's other solar telescopes that will be connected to the high resolution spectrographs used for EPRP work uh, and used for exoplanet detection uh, that are coming. The, obviously, there's loads of ultra high resolution um, spectro for the sun uh, available anywhere. Um, but as I said, the ones that are plugged in to the actual uh, exoplanet detection spectrographs, uh, what makes them different is that they have the long-term stability that you need in uh, exoplanet detection work. And, uh, so whilst the resolution of things like the Kitch Peak Atlas and the IEG Solar Atlas and, and others, um, whilst the resolution is absolutely extraordinary and these spectra are absolutely beautiful, um, 
their stability is is at uh, is about 10 meters per second or higher level uh, making it a little bit more tricky to use it for the EPA rework that we're trying to use it for and, uh, if you want to do anything else with solar spectra I highly recommend those solar atlases because the the resolution is extraordinary um, so let's first talk about the simulations a little bit So this is a work done by Nadege Meunier and others, uh, Anne-Marie Lagrange, um, where you can see the radial velocity uh, in meters per second versus time. The, we're covering almost an entire solar cycle. The scale, if you can't read it, um, complete bottom to top of the plot is from minus four to three meters per second in this uh, top row and from minus two to two meters per second in the bottom row. Um, the left is for the entire uh, solar cycle. Uh, the middle is for a low activity period in that cycle and the right is for a higher activity period during that cycle. So um, the top row is uh, simulated spectra from spots. They used historical records from spots, then created um, stellar spectra from those, um, and then extracted radial velocities then from the simulated spectra, and that is what's plotted here. Uh, they did the same thing for plage records, and this is the bottom row. So top row is for spots, bottom row is for plages. The, so a couple things you can see is that when you go through a solar cycle, a magnetic cycle, is that the variations do get higher at solar maximum and are lower during solar minimum. That's not really a surprise, um, but it's quite obvious from this data, especially in the plages, the, um, the bulge is quite obvious. Now, now, if you look at the low and the higher, uh, the lower and the higher activity periods. For the higher activity periods, we see, especially in the flash days actually, uh, a fair amount of scatter that seems to go with the solar rotation period. Um, for the low activity period, there is not much going on for spots. Um, the ones where it's flat is usually when there are simply no spots on the visible surface. Um, if you've looked at the sun at all in the last two years, there has been many moments where the sun was spot free, uh, if you looked at it, uh, will, which will thus create no radio velocity variations as coming from spots. And, uh, for plages, there is almost a continuous um, semi-periodic change uh, in the radial velocities. Now, if you look at the scale um, for the low activity period, this is well below half a meter per second. And, um, this is, there's barely any radial velocities changing uh, above half a meter per second in a low activity period. In a higher activity period, it's slightly more, but it very rarely extends amplitudes above, semi-amplitudes above two meters per second. Now that same simulation also looked at what happened at the effect of the suppression of convective blue shift. That this was probably explained uh, in Heather Segla's talk. Uh, I'll explain it a little bit later on uh, what it is. But as you can see throughout the magnetic cycle, the suppression of convective blue shift can have an amplitude up to 10 meters per second uh, and quite an enormous amount of scatter throughout. The, even in the low uh, activity period uh, easily becomes two meter per second um, signal that is still there because of the convection of, uh, suppression of convective blue shift. The, in the high activity period, as I said, it can go easily up to 10 meters per second, several meters per second. Um, and even though it is a per, uh, periodic signal, it's not a stable periodic signal. It has, you can clearly see that the solar rotation period is present here, um, but it's not a clean sinusoid um, at all. The bottom is when you add all three together, um, when you uh, add the spots, add the plages, add the convective blue shift 
Now, obviously, the shape looks exactly the same um, as the plots from just the convective blue shift. And uh, the reason for that is simple. It's so overpowering. The suppression of convective blue shift is the main source of solar RV variations. Do note that this is for solar-like stars. Now, this convective blue shift suppression, just to explain a little bit more, the, um, basically the sun is this ginormous beehive where material flows upwards and downwards um, through these convective cells and then goes back down to the uh, intergranular, intergranular lanes. Uh, now, what that creates is when the material flows upwards, that's towards the observer, um, so that comes with a blue shift. And when it goes back down into the intergranular lanes, it comes with a red shift. The, now, because the material flowing up is much hotter um, and the regions are much larger, this blue shift overpowers the associated red shift. And in total, it does create a convective blue shift. Now, that, that in itself is fine. The, if there was this stable convective blue shift, that would be okay, because the, the absolute value of our radial velocity is not what we care about. What we care about is the variations um, around that zero point, around that absolute point. Uh, so if this convective blue shift would be stable, there's nothing to worry about. Um, now, active regions, uh, spots and mainly faculae, um, they're actually covering these convective cells and there's, they're just going to suppress this convective blue shift. The, this suppression of convective blue shift uh, will thus happen in an irregular manner because the active regions are irregular. The, so in the end, even though we have we may have a sort of fixed convective blue shift, it goes all over the place when it's being suppressed by the active regions, mainly the faculae, and you still end up with radio velocity variations that um, are caused by the star itself and by what's happening on the surface of the star. Um, and as you saw in the figures before, the, um, it can go up to several meters per second. Um, the timescales of all these variations will obviously be related to the timescales of the activity happening on the surface. Uh, but as we've seen, uh, there's many timescales to take into account. There's the magnetic cycle, there's the rotation period, and then there's all these smaller timescales uh, related with granul uh, granulation and flows and oscillations. Now, other than simulating spectra, you could also simulate um, cross-correlation functions, uh, CCFs. Um, one widely used code is SOAP 2.0, uh, which was the next version after SOAP. Uh, here you see sort of how it works. And so this is a stellar disk, which you can um, make solar, but you can actually make it to any star you wish. Um, and cross-correlation functions are being made across the stellar disk and then combined, uh, giving you one CCF for the entire star. Uh, you can define uh, spots on the surface, you can define the latitude, you can define the rotation rate. Um, what, you, uh, what is harder to define is the actual evolution of these uh, magnetic regions. And, um, so SOAP is freely available. Um, and these simulated cross-correlation functions can thus be used not just for solar studies, but actually for a whole lot of other stellar studies as well. Now, these were all simulations. It would be much more fun to actually work uh, with the real data of the sun. Um, so before the solar telescopes were um, installed at the higher res uh, EPRV spectrographs, um, there were several ways to actually do it indirectly with a telescope. Um, it could be done indirectly via the moon or via asteroids where the light was reflected um, onto the actual large telescopes, uh, the 3.6 meters in ESO, for example, where HARPS is installed. The, um, or you can reconstruct them from resolved observations and make them unresolved. Now, 
to do the latter is uh, was done for the first time by Nadege Minet and her team, um, where they reconstructed the radial velocities from the MDI SOHO mission. Um, they took a complete magnetic cycle and took all the different pixels of the resolved sun, added them all together um, in order to create the one radial velocity of the resolved uh, of the unresolved sun uh, as if it would have been integrated light um, from a star. Uh, so what you see here is the radial velocity against time again. And as you, you, you might think, you've seen this picture before, but actually you haven't. Uh, the other one was from the simulated spectra. Um, this one is a reconstruction from MBI SOHO. And obviously, uh, it's very hard to tell the difference. So um, these indirect observations reconstructed from SOHO um, very immediately and very clearly uh, confirmed the um, results from the simulated spectra from Nadesh's team, um, where you can clearly see the shape that um, the amplitude goes up to uh, about 10 meters per second during solar maximum um, with six, seven meters per second scatter within and whilst it is much more um, reduced during solar minimum, it can easily still go up to two meters per second variation during our solar minimum when uh, the sun is quite frankly boring. Um, so this was a very good result that these reconstructed radio velocities from resolved observations to make the, to treat them as a star actually confirmed the simulations that were done uh, from the spectra. Then another work uh, used the asteroid Vesta the, um, to bounce light off of. The, so the 3.6 meter telescope um, in Chile was used the, um, that goes into HARPS. So these are HARPS observations. Um, on the top left is the actual radio velocities of the sun um, versus time. Now they have been uh, carefully corrected for all the different motions that uh, are into play here, um, which is the, the motion of the asteroid, the motion of the fact that you bounce it off, all the geometry <clears throat> to actually uh, correct it to a level that this would have been what Harps would have given us if this would have been direct observations of the sun of the star, as a star. The time scale is about 65 days, the, so that's about two and a half um, rotations of the sun. The, as you can see, um, especially in the last part, um, there's clearly a uh, variation going on. The uh, level here is from minus five to five meters per second. It's quite an enormous amount of variations um, happening. What you then, uh, what else is plotted here is in the second panel in pink is the uh, hemispherically average line of sight magnetic flux density, the magnetic, called the magnetic field, um, just a positive one, the, um, which could have been, which was taken from SBO, um, which uh, has a measurement of the magnetic field on, on the surface. So um, they took uh, quasi-simultaneous measurements in order to um, track the magnetic field. And as you can see, uh, apart for this one season where the data scatters in a very unreliable manner, um, the other two seasons give the same shape uh, of variations of the radio velocities and the magnetic flux density. Other things that are plotted are um, the filling factors of the magnetic regions, uh, which trace the radio velocities as well. Um, the full width has half, of half maximum from the cross correlation functions of the spectra that were used to, um, to get the radio velocities that track them fairly well, but not, not, not really well. Uh, the same with the bisector, which is another indicator um, that we can use from the spectra. And the same with the calcium index. You do see that it traces it a little, but not quite in the clear-cut way as the magnetic flux density does. So the, um, here you have plotted the radio velocity variations on the top and the uh, radio velocity variations just from convective blue shift. 
uh, versus on the left the magnetic field, then the filling factor, full width at half maximum, bisector, and the calcium log R prime HK. Uh, if you are confused by any of these indicators, I highly recommend Jen Burt's talk um, that talks about these. Um, so as you can see, uh, the correlation uh, with our standard indicators that we can actually get from our spectra, so these are simultaneous measurements, um, they're pretty weak. Uh, they don't extend the correlation coefficient of 0 0.5. Um, they're sometimes even the correlation coefficients of just 0 0.5. 26, um, which we would barely call a correlation in the first place. Um, the correlation that we have with the magnetic flux density filling factor of the magnetic regions is much stronger. Um, if you don't take into account that first season where the data scattered uh, a fair amount, then the correlation coefficient is of the order of 0.8. Um, which given the error bars on the data is an almost perfect correlation that we could have. The, so clearly, this magnetic flux density outperforms the other standard activity indicators. It's just an issue that um, we currently don't have a real way to simultaneously get that measurement from the spectra together with this precise and stable uh, rate of velocity. Now, um, SDO has been flying for about 10 years now, and if you haven't seen the beautiful movie that NASA released last week, then um, I recommend you look it up. It's They um, have an hour-long video time-lapse of the last 10 years of the sun um, that goes through the magnetic cycle that shows clearly shows the rotation, that clearly shows the spots of the flash and the faculty coming in and out of you. Um, it's, it's, it's stunning, really. Um, so these SDO data was used recently by Rafi Haywood and others um, to reconstruct radial velocities uh, across that entire magnetic cycle, which is one cycle later than the, what the um, team from Nadej Mernier did. Um, so on the top here, you see these reconstructed radial velocities from the SDO mission, uh, where you see the same happening as we saw in the previous cycle, is that during solar minimum, it's actually quite low. During solar maximum, it can go up to here, the scale is 12 to 18 uh, meters per second with a fair amount of scatter um, in it. Um, and with some bursts from time to time, even in solar minimum. Um, What's plotted on the bottom in purple is the um, magnetic field again, the, the hemispherically averaged um, positive unsigned magnetic flux density. Uh, and as you can see, it almost has the exact same shape as the reconstructed radial velocities. Now, these are simultaneous because both the reconstructed radial velocities and the magnetic flux density measurements were taken by, uh, by the SDO mission. Um, a very simple linear fit was performed between the radial velocities and the magnetic flux density to see how much it would improve the radial velocities. The um, RMS of the solar or V variations over the entire magnetic cycle with one simple linear fit already reduced by 62%. This is a factor of 2.6. Um, so whilst this is a lot, um, it is still not exactly what we would need. More complicated models are possibly needed, more complicated models to treat both solar maximum and minimum in a different manner, uh, potentially. And, um, an injection and recovery test of um, long period uh, small planets was performed with a half a meter and 30 cent and 50 centimeters and 30 centimeters per second um, long period planets about between two, three, four hundred days were easily uh, recovered whilst 10 centimeters per second, which is what the Earth has as an effect on the sun, uh, was still not recovered um, from the data, uh, not with the simple linear fit and not with the more complicated model they used in this work. Now, the last thing, and in my very biased opinion, the most exciting thing, um, is the direct observations that we've been doing over the last couple of years. The, um, 
small solar telescopes have been installed um, to be fed into the high resolution stable spectrographs that are used for exoplanet detection. The, um, this is the solar telescope that feeds into Herb Snort. Uh, on the right, you see the TNG, the Italian owned telescope uh, on La Palma. Um, it's about 3.6 meters uh, in diameter and it um, works during the night, obviously, uh, and is plugged into Herb Snort. Uh, on the left, you see the solar telescope that operates during the day and is also plugged into Herbs Nord. Uh, poor Herbs Nord has to now work night and day, but it's totally worth it. Um, in order to appreciate the scale of this solar telescope, um, we have another picture where you can see them working um, on the telescope. On the picture on the right, um, you can actually see a little bit of the outline of the building that contains uh, the large telescope, the TNG. So it sits on its own little platform under its own little cute dome um, and just observes the sun daily from 9 a.m. until about 4 p.m. or whenever the um, observer for the night uh, stops the observations in order to get the night observations ready. Um, we've been observing uh, since July 2015, uh, taking five minute exposures um, every day. Um, it works automatically. Uh, it is under a dome, so it even works when it's cloudy. Um, these measurements can be caught afterwards uh, with a quality factor and are then removed um, after um, the data was taken. Now, two years ago, the same uh, a similar concept was installed uh, in Chile uh, to be fed into HARPS uh, here as well. Uh, the cute little telescope got its own little platform, it got its own little dome. This dome actually opens um, to the sun, uh, but this one also uh, operates daily um, with five minute exposures uh, since October 2020. And as said before, that given that this is ESO data, it, uh, data becomes available after a rolling two-year proprietary period. Well, that's wrong. It's operational since October 2018, and the data becomes available in October 2020. Now, um, So why do we take five minute exposures? Because one would claim that the sun is bright enough um, to not need a five minute exposure, uh, even though our telescope is fairly small, uh, it's not necessary. Uh, so here you can see one day where we tested this, um, where there were 20 second exposures were taken. Um, the error bars were about 47 um, centimeters per second, where the ones of our five minute exposures are 43 centimeters per second. Uh, you can't get it any lower than that uh, because 43 is the um, um, error that comes from the calibration and the error that comes from the stability. So you can't get any lower than 43 anyway. Um, so taking 20 uh, second exposures has nothing to do with the photo noise or the error because the error is still really low. Um, the RMS of this data, as you can see, it varies quite a bit. Uh, it goes from minus three to two and a half, top to bottom, um, meters per second, and there's quite a bit of variation. Uh, note that this is within a couple hours, so the time is minutes. Uh, this is three hours worth of data. Um, so there's quite a bit of variation, and these variations are caused by the stellar oscillations. Again, something that is explained in the talk by Heather Segla. Now, if we would take five-minute exposures, and we, uh, I've bent the, this data into five-minute exposures, then you see that the RMS is greatly reduced from uh, 99 centimeters per second to 48 um, centimeters per second. So that's about half. The, um, so that's quite the reduction. So because you, the oscillations of the sun are on timescales of about five minutes, if you take five minute exposures, you actually average over these oscillation differences uh, so that they are next to gone into the data. The, um, so it's worth thinking about the exposure time you use for your stars. Um, there's recent, there's been work from um, Xavier Dumusk in 2011 uh, already recommending 
um, longer exposure times, not for photo noise purposes, uh, but for oscillation purposes. Um, then there's the recent work by uh, Bill Chaplin and Heather Segler and others that uh, actually uh, give you a code that depending on your stellar type, um, what would be the optimal exposure time uh, in order to um, decrease the variations coming from stellar oscillations. Uh, so this is the main reason that uh, both the Herbst Nerd Solar Telescope and Helios take five minute exposures. It's simply uh, because we then control the stellar oscillations, the solar oscillations. The, um, it's something we do for stars anyway. Um, the, um, especially for the Harps Norton Harps, and um, we take at least 15 minutes of exposure, mainly motivated for photo noise, um, but so also additionally for the very bright stars, motivated for the oscillations. Even on the very large telescopes, it could be recommended that taking the longer exposures of or consequent uh, exposures in order to reduce uh, noise from oscillations signals from oscillations uh, is totally worth it. It's just one less thing of activity to um, care about. All right, let's look at the data. The, um, so the rate of velocities of Harps Nord have been uh, taken and what it looks like if you exclude clouds, uh, cloudy nights and, and, and all of that, it looks like this. Uh, why does it look like this? There is this clear sinusoid present with about 12 meters per second um, semi-amplitude. Well, there's Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is by far the heaviest planet in our solar system. The fact that Jupiter appears to have an almost year uh, period um, in this data simply because we're observing the sun from within the solar system. So we're not observing the orbital period of our planets, we're observing the synodic period of our planets. Uh, and for Jupiter, that is uh, roughly a year. Um, so obviously all the other planets in the entire solar system is in these variations, but Jupiter by far um, overpowers. Now, by using JPL um, data, we can actually correct for it. So this on the bottom is now the data set that I was talking about, free from planets. The planets have been removed. This is a star where we're sure that there's no more plan no planetary signals in at all. Um, where we simply have the stellar or instrumental effects um, present. Um, for those of you who want to look at the scale, this is minus five to five meters per second. Um, obviously a whole lot larger than our arrow bar of the 43 centimeters per second. Um, now, when we first looked at the data, uh, if we bend it here, here it's bent per day. Uh, so all the data has been folded uh, on, on top of one another. Uh, the color is simply time. Um, then we saw that if we would fit that, the, we get the red line and that there was a clear downwards trend during the day um, that was uh, in the data, that was present in the data and that was very persistent. Now, we scratched our heads um, about that a little and then figured out that uh, this was a simple effect of the star that we were observing, not actually being an unresolved star in the sky, but a resolved circle in our sky. Uh, the sun is um, resolved in the sky, uh, so it creates issues that we don't have for stars. It creates issues because the sun is resolved in the sky. Now, it's tilted on an angle amongst which it rotates. The, so what this means is if the sun rises and sets, um, that the approaching and the uh, receding hemisphere of the sun uh, are differently extinct by our atmosphere. Because, again, because the sun is resolved in the sky, we don't have that issue for stars. We only have it for the sun. Um, now, the good news is, because we know the angle uh, and we actually know the extinction coefficients where we can actually uh, get a good measurement of the extinction coefficient because we have so much data, um, we can correct for this effect. 
So once we correct it for that effect uh, with a different extinction coefficient every day, uh, knowing all the angles of the sun, knowing the rotation, knowing the altitude, um, knowing the difference between a winter night and a summer, uh, winter day and a summer day uh, and how high the sun gets, um, we correct it for this and the, um, now there's no such thing as the daily downward trend and the fit is uh, horizontal. Um, if you're interested in the math behind this, um, I urge you to read the Kali Cameron Mortier uh, et al. paper uh, from 2019 that explains it in great detail what's going on. So we now have five full years of data with Harp Snort. Um, the first three and a half years of radio velocities have been released already. Um, the first three years of spectra, uh, cross correlation functions, um, all homogeneously reduced, will be released on the 1st of September this year uh, through the DACE platform hosted by the University of Geneva. And, um, and to just remind ourselves what it is that, why we're doing this, what it is that we're looking for, this is the signal that the Earth has on the Sun. This is a 9 centimeter per second semi-amplitude signal with an orbital period of 365 days. So you can see the little that this is actually a sinusoid and not a flat curve. But this is what you're looking for in radio velocity data. If you truly want to find an Earth twin, if you really want to find an Earth-like planet in an Earth-like orbit around a solar-like star, you're really hunting for the blue wiggle in the black mess. Um, so as you can see, it's nowhere near straightforward to actually be able to find this amongst this uh, unpredictable scatter of the stellar signal. And this even holds for the quiet stars, because at the end of this data set here, the sun is in solar minimum. The sun is uh, relatively boring, there's barely any spots, um, there's still plages and faculae, you still have the convective blue shift, you still have this two meter per second scatter um, that hinders us. Now the power of having both Harps North and Harps South looking at the sun uh, is enormous because there's a little bit of overlap uh, between their days. So uh, what you can see here is for a particular day is the Harps North Solar Telescope data in blue and the Helios Harps Solar Telescope data in, in orange and where it overlaps. And, uh, and as you can see where it overlaps, it traces most of the variations pretty well that if you take the difference, the RMS that is left is about 44 centimeters per second, which is exactly our, the error on both of the instruments. Um, so that's quite amazing, but even for days where there's jumps in the data that we didn't know how to explain and thought that, so you see quite a jump here and then you see a, a jump here right at the end, um, where most of us were convinced that this, this might still be something instrumental, maybe it is, but it's done this in both the Harps North and in the Harp South data sets. So this is not the instrument. The instrument is very stable. Uh, this is the sun doing what it does on a daily basis. Um, and it's good to have confirmation of that, that these radial velocity variations happening because of stellar effects are very unpredictable and are something sometimes happening on time scales that we didn't see coming. Uh, again, the RMS between the two data sets is 43 meters per second, which is the error bar of the data. Now, there are still issues uh, that came to light that uh, here you see the same data, that, so Harps North data and Harps South data over several days. Uh, this is about a month's worth of data. And as you can see, uh, whilst the intrinsic scatter in a day uh, is traced by both, then uh, intraday variability, uh, there's actually jumps present in the data um, that sometimes the Hope North and Arab South never even overlapped, that, or sometimes the blue was higher than the orange or the other way around. The, um, so these were caused by um, taking, um, doing a daily wavelength calibration. Uh, now, luckily, this is an issue in the pipeline, and this is an issue that can be solved after the facts. So currently, the pipeline has being, uh, is being rewritten, um, well, is already rewritten, um, 
and the data um, is now being reduced uh, no longer with a daily wavelength uh, calibration and these jumps are actually gone now. Um, all the data releases that I was talking about will be under the new pipeline so they, these jumps are no longer present in the data. Uh, so it's another benefit you have from observing the sun as a star with your instrument is that it can bring to light um, issues you might have with the instrument or uh, with your pipeline that can then be solved uh, because you know so we know so much about the sun. Um, so does the data contain a solar rotational signal? That's the uh, main question that uh, most of you probably have now. The, here you see the solar radio velocities uh, bent per day, otherwise the data is ginormous, the, for about uh, three years worth of data. The, um, and this is then a uh, BGLS periodogram uh, of the data. Uh, there's the obvious spikes around one day, uh, just created by the aliases. Um, it's something that every ground observation unfortunately has in their data. Uh, but what you can see then is that uh, between 25 and 30 days, there are peaks. Uh, I say peaks because it's not one stable peak. Um, that is related with the solar rotation very clearly, very obviously. Uh, a larger peak though is um, around 14 days, uh, 13, 14 days, uh, which is related with the harmonic of the solar rotations, half of the rotation period. And if you look uh, further, there's a smaller peak at nine days, which is a third of the synodic solar rotation period. Um, so the ob there's obvious effects here that the solar rotation is very clearly picked up. Um, there's longer signals in there, and if you plot it on a longer basis, there's even more um, that can only be due um, to the, the magnetic cycle and its effects uh, with the other time scales. Now, this is a stacked PGLS periodogram where uh, you take the first subset of the data, you make a periodogram, um, you flip it and color code it, uh, where the brighter red is a higher peak, represents a higher peak, then you add a data point to do it again, add a data point, do it again. Uh, so the top row is then. Uh, the BGLS periodogram from the complete data set, the bottom row is just from the small subset and in between you just always add um, a new point. Now as you can see um, from the color changes uh, is that the solar rotation um, gets stronger and then weaker over time when it gets weaker the harmonic actually gets stronger. Um, so this is not a stable signal. The other thing you see is that uh, it wiggles a little. So um, the exact value of the solar rotation, while it's a fixed value, um, is not a fixed value in the data. Now, if you split the data in uh, six chunks uh, of six months the, um, and do it again, then you can see that the picture becomes even more stark where the solar harmonic only is present in two out of the six semesters where the exact value of the solar rotation, again, this is, this is an exact value, is not exactly determined in the data and varies somewhere between 25 and 30 days depending on the season you were looking. Um, this is not the sun spinning up and spinning down um, during this season. This is simply how it represents itself in the data. If you would put this on a similar um, color scale, it gets even worse where you see that the first and the fifth semester uh, had quite a bit of activity um, and while the others also uh, clearly had signs of activity as you could see before, um, they were not as strong as uh, some of the other semesters. So throughout the semester, the actual strength of these signals also varies. So what about our activity indicators? Is there anything we can do um, with those? Because obviously that's what they're there for. And again, I point to Jen Burt's talk to know uh, all about how we measure them. Um, now, if you look at uh, using the data that we had released in Koya Cameron uh, at all. The, this is a periodogram of the radio velocities and then on the bottom from the fluids of half max and the cross correlation function. Um, you've seen this one before where there's peaks multiple around the solar rotation period, uh, harm, uh, first harmonic, second harmonic, 
third harmonic, presumably, the, um, and a couple of longer term uh, signals. If you look at the fourth F half max, there's a very similar, it's not the exact same periodogram that we just did, um, but you also see solo rotation, first harmonic, second harmonic, that and some longer period things. So the periodicity structure and periodicity behavior of these two data sets are, is fairly similar. So one would hope that the actual correlation between those two data sets is, um, is actually pretty good. Now, now if we plot that where the black is all the data and the blue is the bin data, um, then sure, you do see some sign of there may be some sort of positive correlation, uh, but it's very blurred out. This is more a blob than a line. Um, so whilst there is a correlation, whilst they do show similar periodicity behavior, um, the correlation is not strong, uh, which was already seen in the work from uh, Haywood et al. In, uh, with the Vesta asteroid, that the correlation with the forward half max was not strong. Now, this is because of a time lag, not just between the radio velocities and the forward half maximum, but also with the bisector, with all the other activity indicators that we have, there is a temporal offset between the data sets, which if you actually take the correlation between those, it will be weakened because the strongest correlation would be if you shift the data with one, two, or three days, depending on the activity indicator. Um, this has been seen in stars before. Um, so we see it in the sun. Now, quite pronouncedly, the blue is the full half maximum, the red is the bisector, that, 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 that the temporal offset can be up until three days um, between the radio velocity and the activity indicator, obviously weakening the strength of the correlation by quite a bit um, if you don't take that into account. And it's very hard to take that into account in your model if you don't have densely sample data. Um, now, with the extra two years of data going into solar minimum, uh, the picture gets worse where the radio velocity still shows uh, signs of solar rotation, first harmonic, second harmonic, third, and so on. Um, but where the fluid F has F max um, basically shows the solar rotation, a little bit of power still at the first harmonic, but the second harmonic is almost gone. Um, so by going into solar minimum, the fluid F half max becomes an increasingly worse indicator um, to track the radio velocity variations. The, um, this is the same plot, but now using all the data and color code them by time. And as you can see, there might be an additional time dependence where radio velocities and activity indicators behave differently in the long view of the magnetic cycle. Now, we tested this. One of my students, James Hazard, tested this. Um, he used four and a half years of uh, Harpsner solar data. What you can see here, the four panels, is for four different activity indicators that we have uh, from the spectra. Um, this is the correlation coefficient, uh, already including this time shift, the strongest correlation coefficient over time. He took chunks of 55 days, which is about two rotations, uh, calculated the correlation coefficient, take the next chunk, take the next chunk, and so on. Now, as you can see in the beginning, when the sun was slightly more active, most of these correlation coefficients, the time shift um, corrected one, is between 0.6 and 0.8, uh, sometimes quite strong of a correlation. Um, by going into solar minimum, we see this start drop where the um, correlation is either very weak or just non-existent whatsoever. Uh, there are still clearly variations in the radio velocities, but they're no longer tracked by our standard activity indicators, which makes it even harder to try and model them uh, in order to find the planetary signals. The, um, the same student also uh, looked at what happens uh, if you would bin data in order to control granulation. So as you know, we take five minute exposures um, to get the oscillations under control. Um, now, the same can be done perhaps for granulation, which happens on hours to days of timescales. So what he's done here, because we have so much solar data, um, is he took, he did the same exercise as before, this is for the bisector. The, um, but for the red ones, 
he took the average CCF of all the data within one day and then took a chunk of 55 days and got the correlation coefficient. In the blue one, he took a random CCF during the day, um, which is much more like what we do for stars, where we just can't do stare at one star and keep data, uh, take data for like forever. Um, so the blue more represents an uh, um, observational strategy for a star. As you can see, um, if you don't have that densely sampled data to then bin over granulation signals, uh, the correlation weakens um, sometimes by a significant amount. The, if you can take that binning, the correlations get more pronounced, uh, presumably because they track solar rotation effects much better than all the other effects. The, um, so yeah, as I mentioned, there's the big caveat that we can't necessarily get the sampling for stars, though it is still recommended to take several observations, two or three, and then bin over those that you have in order to try and get the granulation under control. Um, now, so as I said before, no known activity indicator that we currently have is perfect. This is work done by Jesus Maldonado from the Harps North Solar Team, where he checked um, calcium index, H alpha, H beta, H gamma, H delta, H epsilon, helium, sodium, um, and compared it with sunspots, compared it with um, the um, uh, radial velocities. And whilst all of them show clear correlations, um, these are the periodograms with the blue line indicated to solar rotation is that some of them don't even track the solar rotation really well. Um, they have different values than what the RV show. They don't show it at all. They show variation on a different time scale. They, um, so none of the activity indicators that we currently know and have tested uh, track the radio velocity variations in a manner that we would want other than the magnetic flux density that we can't get simultaneously from our spectra yet. So what about photometry? Uh, it's an often used technique to um, use uh, simultaneous photometry uh, in order to, or quasi-simultaneous photometry in order to track the stellar activity. The um, problem there is, again, the same. This is work recently done by Molly uh, Kosiarek uh, PG student from Ian Crossfield, uh, who used Empire and source data, uh, photometry from the sun, and compared it with the uh, released Harps and radio velocities, um, full width at half max and uh, by sectors. And, um, and as you can see, these are per per periodograms for them in the four years of which the data, well, three and a half years of which the data was released um, with the gray indicating solar rotation period and its harmonics. The, now, as you can see, the peaks all happen at different periods. So periodograms quite often do not determine the rotation period in photometry, um, which is something to think about because it's, often, it's very often used um, to look at the variation that happens within photometry and then claim that to be the rotation period if you if you see here that the peak they would have detected is 40 days, whilst we know that's not true uh, for the sun, and the radio velocities actually give different peaks. Um, so it's quite dangerous to use um, photometry to very uh, strictly determine your rotation period. Uh, the same happens for an ACF, uh, autocorrelation function approach. Um, you can also check the work of uh, Shani Nava recently um, that uh, did a similar investigation about rotation period peaks uh, as determined by periodograms. If uh, so, Molly and uh, uh, Ian did use GPs as well, Gaussian processes. I talk, uh, yeah, I point uh, to Vanessa's talk um, to know what they're all about. The, um, where, as you can see, the amplitude evolutionary time scale, rotation time scale, and length um, scale fa are fairly well determined for all four data sets, four data sets being the photometry, the rate of velocities, the forward that have maximum, and uh, by sector, uh, but not always. There are several cases where even the rotation time scale in some seasons 
uh, were differently detected between the radio velocity and the photometry. So even in using GPs, it's not a perfect system. It's way better than using, just simply using pre-autogram or a simple sinusoid. Uh, using a GP is better, but it's still not optimal. So while it, whilst it can be helpful, it doesn't always trace the same variability. Um, photometric variability uh, can be different uh, so the same as radio velocity variability across wavelengths. So it's also important which wavelength band, photometric band was used for the photometry that you're using. So there's a lot of uh, pitfalls with this approach, but it's performing relatively well if you use it wisely. Uh, another thing we figured out um, that I just wanted to point out is the work by UC student Tim Milburn um, and others with the Harps North Solar team that um, verified that uh, source photometry and others um, do not necessarily correlate well with the, with the radial velocity variations, but it does correlate well with the magnetic filling factor. Um, but uh, perhaps more importantly, what they also found is that small active regions on the sun, smaller than uh, 60 megameters squared, the, actually do not significantly suppress convective blue shift. That the suppression of convective blue shift really only happens for the larger bright uh, magnetic regions on the surface. And all these teeny tiny little uh, magnetic regions actually do not contribute. So we should um, luckily perhaps only care about the larger ones. Now, so just to summarize all the lessons that we've learned from sun as a star observations, um, is just why do we do sun as a star observations? It's simply because the sun is the only star, star we'll ever be sure that has no planets in the data. Now, obviously the sun has planets, but you can remove them confidently from the data. Um, you can resolve the sun and then compare it with your unresolved observations. Um, if you do observe the sun as a star, it comes with uh, a little tricks you have to do in the data processing, um, such as the differential extinction because the sun is resolved in the sky. Uh, but it can also help to improve your instruments, to attract stability, to um, improve your pipeline. Um, suppression of convective blue shift is the main source of the radio velocity variations for solar-like stars. Um, and even in solar minimum can be larger than one meter per second, uh, which is more than um, order of magnitude larger than the signals of small planets in Earth-like orbits around solar -like stars. Magnetic flux density traces radio velocity variations best, but we currently have no way uh, yet to um, simultaneously determine that. Uh, traditional activity indicators uh, can show weakened correlations because of temporal offsets uh, and are really uh, no good uh, activity indicators, no good tracers uh, during solar minimum. Um, binning can help, the, um, so which can indicate to the fact that granulation is badly tracked by these standard uh, activity indicators. But if you're looking for long period planets, the, um, you could design a, an observation strategy where you do bin over the data and it's not a problem for the planetary signal because it's on such long timescales. Simultaneous photometry can obviously help if analyzed carefully um, with um, Gaussian processes or other uh, methods. Um, the solar rotation period that comes out of a simple periodogram or an autocorrelation function is not always reliable. It heavily depends on the photometry. It heavily depends on the type of variation during the season that you were observing. Uh, and finally, large bright magnetic regions are the source of our RV variations. Them suppressing the convective blue shift is what does the trick. Smaller magnetic regions, the very small ones, uh, barely contribute and um, are not that important. Now, studying the sun as a star helps us thus to understand the activity-induced radio velocity variations. It will allow us to test our models, to test our theories, to test our algorithms. Um, it's the way forward to detecting a true Earth twin with the enormous caveat that observing the sun as a star will only help 
for solar-like stars in planet detection. It is no guarantee that we can extrapolate this to other stellar types. But in the end, we all do this to one day find the truer twin. Um, thank you. <laughs>